Go with me to Judges chapter 16. Judges chapter 16, it's there that we have been studying the story of Samson and Delilah. We've been studying six Hebrew words. The Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew. These six Hebrew words we have called the six stages of sexual compromise, temptation, or bondage. As it's been said, nobody wakes up one morning and decides, hey, I'm going to trade it all in. I'm going to wreck my marriage. I'm going to decimate my children, lose their respect, run off with some strange person. Nobody does that. It's a process. It's a progression. Similarly, in Samson's life, Samson's a champion. He represents God's people. And uh, he's a terminator. He's a Rambo. He takes on whole armies and militaries that are opposing God and God's people. And um, God has given Samson a great strength from his youth, from actually infancy. His mom had committed him to a vow of consecration. God had given him this secret strength. God had given him this special strength. But he had a weakness, and his weakness was women. Philistines, one of the enemies of God's people, knew this. And they knew that he had an attraction to a valley girl whose name was Delilah. Well, you guys are very dramatic. Some of you are like, finally, we will never have to do that dumb, breathy name. And uh, yes, we will move on to um, more sophisticated things in the future. But uh, Delilah becomes the downfall for Samson. Delilah is promised millions of dollars from the Philistines to find out the secret of Samson's strength. So as it begins, it starts where Delilah says in verse 5, Delilah entices Samson. That's where it all begins, enticement, temptation. From there, the Bible says in verse 16 that Delilah pestered. These are the stages that you and I go through in the process of sexual compromise or sexual perversion. At first, we're just tempted. We're enticed. We're lured. There's this sparkling image and concept and idea and thought, but of course, it cloaks a deadly hook. From there, we go where, to where we're pestered, just almost paranoid every day with the thought of enjoying some sex outside of God's intended context, which is one man, one woman in the commitment of marriage as defined in the beginning of Scripture in the book of Genesis. Outside of that, there's perversion and compromise. And at first, it's this idea of temptation. Then we're pestered and overwhelmed with the thought. It feels like, man, it's everywhere we turn, every ad, every commercial, every, every marketing campaign. It's so super sexualized. It's just too much. And from pestering, we become vexed, as it says of Samson. Vexation is this place where you feel like resistance is futile. I can't overcome this. I can't resist this. It's too much. And we feel vexed, just like Samson was. From vexation, we go to this state where the Bible says Delilah lulled Samson to sleep. We've looked at all of these Hebrew words. Lulled speaks of this sleepy state. This numb state that we find ourselves in, in our conscience, in our ability to be sensitized to what is right and wrong and what is inappropriate. Maybe in this stage, you've experienced this. You're approached by a spouse or a friend or a city group leader or a pastor, and they're appealing to you based on your conduct and maybe a coarse joke or something you said, like, hey, that's not okay. What's going on? And you seem completely desensitized and numb and oblivious to the fact that there's a problem. Sometimes, people experience this sleepy state in the area of their conscience because it is a mode for survival. They're insulating themselves just in the name of sanity. They know they've made so many poor decisions and things have gotten so bad, but they want to ignore it. They want to go to sleep on it. They want to be numb to it. They don't want to address it. They don't want to deal with it. So they become numb and they no longer are even sensitive to what's right and wrong and what God intends and God's plan. They've, they've been lulled to sleep from, from that state. It says, after she lulled Samson, she tormented him. This, of course, is the dark, depressing place that is very real that people can find themselves in, in the area of their morality and sexuality. Interestingly enough, even the studies of pornography tell us that 
Pornography is like similar to a synthetic drug when it comes to the brain and even your body. It offers this ecstasy. It offers this extraordinary high. But what they're learning now, even in the study of effects of pornography, is similar to a synthetic drug. It, t it drops you. It drops you so deep, so fast, and so far. It's astronomical. People are experiencing levels of depression that we've never known before because of the pornographic phenomenon in today's society and culture. This is a real place as it was for Samson as he was tormented. In, in conclusion today, I want to continue in our reading. It says that uh, Samson told Delilah all of his heart, told the secret of his strength, which is his vow and his consecration to God. She realizes this is the truth this time. She calls up the Philistines and they cut off his hair. It says in verse 20, and she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he woke from his sleep and here's what he said. Whether he whispered it or spoke it, we're not entirely sure. But nonetheless, he said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know the Lord had departed from him. And the Philistines took him and put out his eyes, brought him down to Gaza, bound him with bronze fetters and he became a grinder in the prison. In conclusion of this series, I want to look at this word bound or bondage, which is a very real place that people find themselves in, specifically in relationship to their sexuality and morality. Let's read 22, though, as a source of great encouragement. It does say at the end of this story, however, the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaven. How many of you are here today because of a huge however? Come on. How many grateful for the however of God? I want to speak to you again from the subject of bound. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and your goodness. We know that you're here. We sense your presence. We sense your nearness. Pray, Holy Spirit, that you would help us to see Jesus. For we know, God, if we'll see Jesus, that's what will change us. We need you. We need you, Jesus. Thank you for the sunshine. Thank you for the vitamin D. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Everybody said? Amen. Maybe it's because the sun's out, but I've been thinking about the first time I went boogie boarding. How many have ever been boogie boarding? Okay, not surfing. It's a short. They call it body boarding, too bodyboarding, boogie boarding, and uh, first time I ever went boogie boarding was also pretty much the last time. <laughs> I was 11 years old. We were in Honolulu. Dad was asked to come speak at a camp in Honolulu. How many feel like you're supposed to take a speaking engagement in Honolulu? You feel like you need to go preach the gospel and be a missionary in Honolulu? I feel that too. Thank you, Jesus. Um, how many would like to have City Church Honolulu? You, you just feel, yeah, okay. How many would like to be the pastors of City Church? Okay, so many volunteers to plant churches now. It's unbelievable. So we're there in Honolulu, and meanwhile, my dad is studying, praying, prepping for the night meeting. They send their helpless, white, 11-year-old son to bodyboard with the locals. It was a recipe for disaster. I'm out there, never been out there. They spoke of things like a reef. I was familiar with Christmas reefs. And, uh, you know, I mean, Seattle, we have water. We just don't go in it. Come on, somebody. <laughs> we just look at it. But uh, so we're out there, and, and um, they said, hey, watch out for the coral reef. I'm like, coral? Only thing I know about coral, it's a color that mom says goes well with other colors and decorating a house. But anyways, a little little picture and window into the way I was raised. But, uh, son, do you like my outfit? Okay, moving right along. A lot of shopping, a lot of interior decorating in this guy's raising experience, growing up experience. But um, so we're out there in the middle of, of, of the waves here, and the locals are like, watch out for the reef, you know, bro. And I'm like, okay, cool. And so I'm watching them, and they're doing their thing. I'm just kind of rolling over the waves, just kind of holding on. And at some point, I'm like, I'm, I'm going to do this. So I, uh, I guess I, later I found out you, I did what you're not supposed to do. I just, I saw the wave coming. I just pointed my boogie board directly straight with the beach. Evidently, you're supposed to kind of, kind of angle it. I didn't know that, so because, because locals don't teach non-locals how to boogie board. So, um, I just point it directly towards the beach, and here comes the wave. And at first, it's like whoosh, and I'm like, this is awesome. 
that all of a sudden, this probably about a three to four foot wave, which it might as well have been 34 feet, you know, it's like, oh my God, it, it breaks on my back. I was later told that can, that can actually create paralysis. Oh, great, fantastic. So from that point, I go into what I, what I affectionately call the death roll. And um, for the first time in my life, I'm, I'm, I'm caught in the middle of the wave. The board is n- no longer in existence. And I am rolling this wave, and I'm getting cleaned by the reef, chafed by the reef. I'm just cu- getting cut up my chest, my hands, and I'm 11 years old. This is a sweet little boy. And... Uh, <laughs> So I don't know how this works, but at some point your brain goes, we got to get out of here. Like, we got to go. So I go to, like, get out of the wave and realized I, I can't get up. This, this wave is controlling me. It has me down. And if you've ever been held under by a wave, you're not getting up until the wave says you can get up. How many of you have experienced this? I'm curious, how many of you went back into the ocean after that experience? You need medical attention. No, I'm serious. You need to go get checked out right away. That's the definition of insanity. Me? I'm a smart guy. I've been at the pool ever since. Okay? But anyways. So, I'm trying to, I mean, if you've had that experience, which many of you have, you're like, I need to, I need to go now. You're not going anywhere. You are held down and you are helpless, aren't you? Till all of a sudden, it's like the wave relented. I come shooting. I'm standing on the reef. I come shooting out of the water. I'm like, help! Oh my God! You know, I'm screaming, 11 years old. Every once in a while, I'd be a little bit dramatic and that sort of thing. And, oh my God, help! And here's all the locals lined up, sitting on their boards, laughing. And I've been bitter at Hawaiians ever since. No, I'm just teasing. Aloha, mahalo. But, um, Bondage, this word bound, means to be held under. Held under the power of something. Even when you want to get up and you want to get out. And what started off like a rush, what started off like a whoosh, what started off as fun is now controlling you and holding you an environment you can't live long under. What ends up happening with bondage is you think, This is where it all ends. I'm going to be a statistic just like my dad, just like my grandpa, just like my mom. I'm going to succumb to the same sin, the same temptation, the same urges. You want to get up. You hate where you are. It's hurting, but you're helpless. You can't just get up. A great scholar once said, sin will take you further than you want to go, cost you more than you want to pay, and keep you longer than you want to stay. Bondage. You started off like, this is fun. This is exciting. This is, ooh, I kind of like this movie. Ooh, that was kind of a racy scene, but it was kind of fun to watch. And I like this show. Oh, that was kind of inappropriate, but... Man, that person's good looking. Man, that's fun. Wow, it'd be fun to kind of think, what would it be like to be with that person and be, wow, to live that life. Ooh, I like, ooh, this is fun. Wow, this magazine, this is kind of, it just kind of feels good. And wow, this is, man, these chat rooms, this is, I mean, I'm just kind of talking. And I mean, I'm single, I'm not married. It's not like I'm cheating on anybody. But man, it's just fun to like interact with these people. Oh, you want to get together? Oh, sure, yeah, that'd be fun. And And what starts off as something I can control. It's like Samson. He tells Delilah, bind me with new ropes. (laughs) And he's like, these these ropes can't bind me. Yeah, yeah, weave my hair. It can't stop me. Then he gets a haircut. And he wakes up with the same arrogant attitude, doesn't he? I'll shake myself free. (laughs) Ha, ha, ha. No, no, you won't. But that's how sexual temptation, perversion, and bondage works. It's just a magazine. It's just a glance. It's just a thought. It's just a phone call. It's just a fun, flirty moment with a fellow employee. 
What's the big deal? This won't bind me. This won't control me. And then you wake up someday and you can't get up. And you go, what happened? You're in bondage. If somebody woke up, somebody walked up to you today, particularly if it's a perfect stranger, and said, you're in bondage. You'd be like, whoa, hey there, slugger. What's your name again? Don't even know you. Bondage? I don't think so. In some cases, they may be right. We walk around, talk, look, laugh, smile like everybody else. But when it comes to our morality and our sexuality, we are held under by an unseen force. And we can't get up. What ends up happening is in this place, we, we pull out all stops sometimes. We start to hate this place. I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. I, it's the sick cycle of bondage where you have a month that's good or two months that's good, but then you're back doing that activity, engaging in that illicit activity or that fantasy or the phone calls or the thoughts or the images or the interactions or the escapades in some random motel somewhere. And, and then you, you, you come back and you go, I'm not, I'm not going to do that anymore. That's not who I am. And you have a good string of days or weeks or months, but then you're, you're back again. It's this sick cycle and you keep thinking, I'm going to try harder and you've got tears and maybe you're married and you're expressing to your spouse, I'm not going to do that anymore. That's not who I am. I'll I'll, I'll, I'm going to try harder. You'll see. I'm going to beat this. And just like Samson, we might as well say, you'll see. I'll shake myself free. As if my skinny little 11-year-old body could have overcome that wave. I was no match for that wave. And you are no match for sexual temptation and sin. Sir, the truth is you're no match for pornography. Go ahead, Samson. Try to shake yourself free. You cannot. But the Bible says the Lord had departed. Samson had started to think his strength had something to do with him, didn't he? He started to think, I think God chose me. I'm a pretty good guy. It proves that he thought that way because when things got bad, he says, I'll, I'll do it. I'll rip off the ropes like I've done. I'll show them that I'm good and I'm strong, but without God, he was weak like any other man. It's the essence of religion, isn't it? When we find ourselves in compromising seasons or activities or situations under the power of sin and temptation and compromise, and we start to ascribe to what reeks of humanism, I'll shake myself free. Babe, I promise I'll try harder. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm throwing all the magazines away. I, I'm canceling cable. You'll see. Friend, I recommend that. I'm not opposed to that. But if God's not in it, it only results in momentary relief. That's all. And it'll happen again. I thought this was one of those hope churches where you guys are like encouraging. This guy's intense. The point is, there's only one hope, isn't there? There's only one hope. See, so quickly and so soon we forget how salvation happens. For how you are saved is how you are sustained. And how you are sustained is how you're set free for the rest of your life. Let's consider, let's step back for a moment collectively as a community and let's consider salvation again. Here's what subtly we don't intend to, but subtly we start to believe, particularly maybe it's been a long time since that salvation experience you had 20, 30, 40 years ago, and we start to think that this is how salvation went down. God looked at hurting humanity and said, see those people? They're a diamond in a rough. That's a diamond right there. I know there's rough around the edges, but there's potential there. See that guy right there? He's got some bad stuff. He's got some good stuff, 50-50. If I lock in on the good 50, we got a chance to turn this whole thing around. <laughs> see that guy right there? He's a bad guy, but I can see the good in him. I mean, are we talking about Star Wars or Jesus? 
Is this humanism or the gospel? That's not the gospel. God did not look at humanity. For the Bible says before the foundation of the world, the Lamb was saying, which tells me even before men and women were created, God intended within himself to sacrifice on their behalf. Which tells me this is the gospel. God looked at humanity and saw nothing of merit in us. For if even one ounce or one iota or one percent of salvation is our merit, then what becomes of grace? It can't be. It, there cannot be the mention of grace. If God chose you because he thought, oh, this person is better than that guy, so I choose him. <laughs> because if that's how salvation worked, then if you're struggling now that you're saved, you're struggling in any area of your life, particularly sexually or morally, then hey, the way you were saved had to do with your merit. So now you ought to work your way, access your goodness to improve your morality. If that's the gospel, we are no different than any other group on the planet. And what we worship is not a person, but is moralism. What we worship is not a person, but principles. All we are is a community that has come to agree on a collection of principles and the simple idea of moralism. That's all we are. Or we're Jesus people who believe that the person of Jesus solely and exclusively is the answer to broken, hurting humanity. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 2 proves what I'm talking about. It says, speaking of salvation, but God. How many know it doesn't say but Judah? But Leon, but Chelsea, but Susan, but Brian, but Billy, but Amanda. None of your butts saved anybody. <laughs> if that offended you, I was speaking about a word. <laughs> B-U-T, not B-U-T-T. -T. <laughs> but God. That's the whole gospel right there. But God, you ever talk to somebody and they say, hey, man, you're one of my closest friends. You know that, right? And I'll say, man, I appreciate you, but <laughs> can I give you a suggestion? Whatever they said before the but doesn't matter at all. Don't even listen to it. Only thing you need to listen to is what they say after the but. How many know what I'm talking about right now? That's exactly how the gospel works. You were bound. You were dead. You were selfish. You were arrogant. You were prideful. But... And all that stuff before the butt, it don't really matter. Because what comes after the butt is what changes everything. And what comes after the butt is God and Jesus and redemption and mercy and grace. Somebody say, but God. That's the gospel. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his. God saved you. Not because of what was in you, but because of what was in him. That's the gospel. Because of his love, because of his mercy, because of his goodness, because of his righteousness, because of his mercy, because of his sovereignty. Notice what it says, because of his great love. Even when we were dead in trespasses. Have you ever seen a dead body? Have you ever been to a funeral, walked up to the casket and say, this guy's got good character? Somebody would say, you, you mean he had good character. That's nice. No, I mean he has good character. Look how considerate he is, being so quiet during the funeral. <laughs> what? Dude, he's dead. Yeah, but I still think he's showing some great exemplary uh, uh, qualities. Look how patient he is. <laughs> Look how long-suffering he is. Are you, are, are you okay? He's dead. There's no merit left there. You can speak of who he was, but th he's dead. That's what we were. You don't look at dead people and say, 
you're great. That's why I'm coming. Your, your character qualities are absolutely astounding. They're dead. And that was you and that was me. But God, who is rich in mercy, while we were still dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. For parentheses, for by grace you have been saved. This is how you're saved. Good news, this is how you're saved. Good news. See, this is why we can, we can so profoundly say there are no outsiders with Jesus. <laughs> you don't have to be anything. He's already everything. And he loves you. You can't stop Jesus. I mean, you can't, you can't, you can't stop him because he doesn't, he doesn't come to you based on you. He comes to you based on him. You can't stop him. You can't change him. He's unchangeable. So no matter what you do, here he comes. Jesus, I'm, I'm going to stop. I'm going to, I'm not. This is, this is the gospel. See, all of our faith, all of our good works, which I believe in, all of that is subsequent, secondary, and in response to his coming, his initiative, his grace, his goodness. If that's the case, the way you're saved is the way you're sustained. The way you're sustained is the way you're set free. If that's the way God saved you, will it not also be the way God continually sets you free from momentary, seasonal, or extended periods of time and you're walking with Jesus of bondage and sin and failure and temptation? Can I make a statement? God remembers that you're dust. You're not fooling him. He knows what's really going on in your heart. He knows the consistency and the true state of your desires and your fantasies and your secret life. He knows. And he loves you. And he loves you. It's, <laughs> you're not set free based on merit. You're set free based on his love and his goodness. My message remains the same, doesn't it? It's like, good Lord, Judah just keeps preaching the same stinking message. That's right. Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. And something inside of me says, if I can just keep putting Jesus out there, eventually we'll all go, either Jesus is enough or he isn't. See, I'm, here's what I'm going to do for the next 30 years. We're just going to keep saying, either Jesus can help you or he can't. Last night, last night I, I was preaching this message a little bit different. It's better now. And I was preaching this and <laughs> cried through most of the sermon. And I went in the back room and I just started crying. I was crying for you. Just, and I'm an emotional guy, but I'm crying. And, and I just kept on God. I said, God, these are your people. And if you don't set them free, nobody else can. You know how hurting they are. Some of you, 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 it's like you hate yourself. God, I hate what I've become. I hate what I did to my wife. I hate what I did to my kids. I hate what I did to my husband. I hate, God, I hate it. And I see the pain and the anguish on your face. I can see it. And either God is enough or he's not. If he's not, leave now. Stop coming to church. This is just a shenanigan. This is just a religious tradition. We're just going through a routine that's lifeless. But if he's enough, well, then, then that changes everything. Here's what I believe will happen in these last days there will be a rise and a surge in the preaching of Jesus plus nothing is the answer to humanity. That's what I believe is happening right now on the planet. <laughs> it's happening. 
It's happening. People are going, either he's God or he's not, but if he's God, he's everything I'll ever need, and he'll see me through. I end with this story. Jesus, in the whole story of recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Synoptic Gospels, and, and then John's Gospel, he, he, we see the story of Jesus going to the cross, and every, everything seems to kind of be hand in hand. And then there's this one character that seems to interrupt the narrative. Jesus is on his way. He's going to go to the cross. And then there's this guy. His name's Barabbas. We don't even know much about him except that he's a murderer, a leader of an insurrection, a rebel. And why he's even mentioned, sometimes I'm not so sure. It's like, what? Let's, this is about Jesus and going to the cross. And there's this little story that unfolds. And a couple of the Gospels give it a few more details than the others. What it was is Pilate. Y'all remember Pilate, leader in Rome, and he regional leader, and he, he comes to Jesus, and they've accused him of, you know, king of the Jews and all this, and mocking their God, and so he says, are you the king of the Jews? Is it as you say, Jesus says, and then John 19, 11, Pilate ends up saying, like, uh, do you know who I am? Because Jesus gets really quiet. Do you remember Pilate's like, I want to know your bio. I want to know where you're from. I want to know your details, and, and he says, are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you or the power to release you? And look what Jesus says. I love this part. You could have no power at all against me unless it was given to you from above. In other words, this is not a tragedy, Pilate. Pilate, you are not in control. In a funny, ironic twist, you're not the pilot here. <laughs> you're not driving this ship, buddy. This is my father. Don't be fooled. This wasn't a murder. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ was not a murder. It was not a tragedy. It was the plan and purpose of an almighty, loving, gracious God. So in this moment, Pilate thinks, I hold the destinies of these two men in my hand. I know the Jews have a tradition that on a holy day, I will release one of the prisoners on death row. Whichever one who wins the popularity contest. So in a weird, almost heretical twist of events, Pilate stands on this audacious stage the gall, the nerve, and the audacity of this Roman leader who now presents Jesus, son of the living God, versus Barabbas, the thug and rebel. He says, all right, Jews, who do you want? Who should I set free? When I've read this passage, I thought, God, this should not be. Why even add this part? The heresy, the blasphemy that Jesus, the Son of the living God, God in flesh and bone, moments before his death, he would have to endure a popular vote, a popularity contest. Is this American Idol or redemption? This is blasphemy. This has is, this is gone too far. There's no comparison. This is a rightful prisoner. A man who should be on death row. He's a rebel against Rome. He leads a rebellion. He murders people. He's a bad man. He's a thug and he's a crook. And he deserves the chains and he deserves the crucifixion. Jesus? What has he done but heal, restore, deliver, set free? Open blind eyes, open deaf ears, heal the lame and the leper. What, what has Jesus done? Who do you want, Jews? I think sometimes even beyond their understanding, they were mustered by some of the religious leaders and said, we, we, we want Barabbas. What? Yeah, give us Barabbas, Pilate thinks. Well, the people have spoken. It wasn't the people that decided just like it wasn't Roman soldiers that put the hands and feet of Jesus on a cross. It was love. It was sovereignty. It was God. People say, give us Barabbas. The Roman soldiers come up. The people have spoken. He won the vote. And they put the key in and they unlock Barabbas from his chains and shackles. And he walks down the platform, welcomed by all of his thug friends. Yeah, the people love me. Yeah, that's right. I don't even know who this Jesus guy is, but all I know is my people love me. There, is, there seems to be no conscience in Barabbas. There's no record of him turning to Jesus and saying, I owe you everything now, for you have set me free. No, I don't see any of that in Barabbas. And God knew that. 
Have you read stories in the Bible, even growing up hearing sermons, of people who, they had some nobility, they had some merit, they had some faith, they had some goodness. They, it's, it's as if you could say they were worth saving. But Barabbas, what did Barabbas deserve? What did Barabbas do to deserve freedom and liberty? Jesus stood there silent for he knew the will of the Father. He said, that's fine, Father. Let him have Barabbas. For Jesus knew that the Father would have to treat Jesus like Barabbas so he could treat Barabbas like Jesus. Pilate thought he was the leader of this vote. Barabbas thought it was the people that set him free. No, 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 no. It was the love of a heavenly father. Pilate said, well, take him, even at the warnings of his own wife. Take him, scourge him, whip him, mutilate him, beat him, hang him on a cross. See, when I look at the story, I realize who Barabbas really is. He seems to pop up in the middle of the most important portion of the gospel. He pops up and he disappears. But I finally figured out who Barabbas is. That's me. That's you. That's us. You know what the name Barabbas means? Son of a father. That's you. That's me. We're just an average, everyday descendant of Adam, born in sin. Son of some good dads or maybe some not so good dads. We're just an average everyday person. And frankly, any bondage, any chains we're in is of our own doing. And we deserve it. Jesus, he's the father's son. He's the rightful inheritor. He's perfection personified. Deserves all glory and honor and esteem and worship and praise and power. But he lets the thug, the undeserving, arrogant, self-sufficient thug go free. Not Barabbas, Jesus. No. Yes, I love Barabbas. What? I love Barabbas. I'll be honest, I never thought this way. I read this passage recently and I'm going, Jesus loves Barabbas. It pleased the Father. Please hear me. I would never understand the height, the width, the length, and the depth of the love of God. For we have no record that Barabbas ever turned to God or ever even acknowledged the sacrifice of his almighty son. But God loved Barabbas. What? And I felt, I was reading this the other day, and I felt God speak to me. I love Barabbas. I love him. But God, he's bad, man. I love him. And I wanted him to go free. But didn't you know that he probably would have never acknowledged the free gift? Yeah, but I love Barabbas. For while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God sent his son for Barabbas. Even the ones he knew would walk away from Jesus and his free gift and never come back. He loves them. And the gnaw and gir the, the, gnaw, the, the nerve, the gall and the audacity of believers to think, I got saved by grace, but now that I'm in this deep, dark place of bondage, I better work hard to get myself out. What? That's the opposite of the gospel. Are you bound? Are you held under the power of this temptation, this sin, the sexual urges? Do you feel like it's controlling you? What are you going to do, Samson? I'm going to shake myself free. Stop it! No, you won't! You're no match for the powers of hell and the urges of sin and sexual temptation. You will not overcome it and you will never overcome it. You'll just be another statistic. There's no answer within yourself. Your own merit, your own goodness, your own discipline, your own devotion will not save your marriage and will not save your kids. There's only one. And he's the one that took your place. 
He's the one that stood silently on the platform with Pilate and said, yes, let him have Barabbas. Take me. How many times have I stood on that platform with Pilate and Jesus and I'm the Barabbas and they start to take my chains off and I say, no, no, I deserve this. I deserve the guilt. I deserve the shame. I deserve the consequence. I deserve it. And Jesus seems to look at me and say, no, son, let me have it. Let me have your sin. Let me have your pain. No, God, I did it to myself. I deserve it. My marriage won't make it. This is what I deserve. I deserve divorce. I deserve poverty. I deserve sickness. I deserve it all. No. He says, give it to me, son. No, I, no. I don't want to. And I find myself at times holding on to my own chains. How sick is that? But somehow it satisfies the self-righteous religious part of me that says, no, I, 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 I deserve this. I've got to work. I've got to try harder. I've got to do better. No, 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 Jesus. Son, give me your sin. I want it. No, oh God, no, oh God. I can't fathom this. Jesus wants your sin. What? Give it to me, son. God, I, I'm so ashamed. Give me your shame. But God, what if I do it again? I'll still be here. Oh, God, I don't want to hurt you. I love you. I, I don't want to do this anymore. Give me your sin, son. This is all we got. It's all I got. It's all you got. We can play games. We can play church games. We can pretend like some people are better than others, and that's why they're blessed. Or we can all come to the honest conclusion that it's God. And it's God alone. The challenge I have is believing it's this good. The greatest challenge is not your discipline, your devotion, your focus. Your greatest challenge is believe in the gospel. Could it be that there's a God with a love so scandalous, so wide, so deep, so vast, so high, so expansive, so welcoming, so inclusive? Let me have your sin, son. Okay. When I give him my sin, and I stand in this empty space of forgiveness and acceptance while Jesus walks off to the cross that I deserve. I see him, I see him walking to the post to be whipped. As I stand a free man, all the attention is turned now. And I feel the love of God saying, go son, live your life. I'll pay the price. Where did we get off thinking that we were going to set ourselves free? It's still Jesus. It'll always be Jesus. It'll never stop being the power of Jesus. If his blood is sufficient for your salvation, his blood is sufficient to sustain you through every challenge and every sin and every temptation. Jesus is enough. He wants your sin today. How crazy is that? Let him have it. It's so hard. It's so humbling. God, here's my sin. I got it, son. See, you're already forgiven. But it's like forgiving yourself, isn't it? And letting him quit holding it on. It's, it's done. It's done.